지킬 Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Weekly Pulse. It's me here, uh, Dan, in the basement of Forbidden Planet. It's June 12th right now. By the time you see it, it's going to be the 13th. And that means what? New comics. There's a lot that came out. We're going to talk about a couple of things, me and uh, the dummy. And by the way, he, uh, he can't speak, but we have a telepathy between us. So if he has anything to say, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Starting with an exclusive that we have here at the store, uh, this is me every day, Josh Cochran. Uh, a little illustration magazine, some great stuff in here. It's eight dollars. Sound a little steep? I thought so too until I realized that it was limited edition, that you can't really get it anyplace else. And the art is frankly fantastic and interesting, and I, I always love something that uses um, newspaper as something to print on. I just think that's got a really interesting uh, visual quality. And I like the smell myself, I don't know about you. Uh, but. This is really interesting and something a little off the beaten path. So we're going to work backwards off the beaten path to a little more well-known uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Season 9, number uh, 10. You should be telling me what number it is with the telepathy. So number 10 came out, and it was really good. I usually don't talk about the Buffy comics because they've been middle of the road for a while, which has been kind of par for the course with Buffy. This reads a little bit like Graduation Day Part 3, if you're familiar with the show, and why would you be reading the comic if you weren't? It rehashes um, a lot of those interesting things with the characters and the dynamics. Uh, put uh, Simone in the place of Faith, put Spike in the place of Angel. And even though that sounds a little derivative, it's actually very compelling, and we're moving Buffy into this very new adult space, which I think is something they probably should have done a long time ago, but they're doing it now. This seems like a really nice place if you'd fallen off, you could jump on here and uh, be uh, actually excited about a Buffy comic, which is nice. Speaking of uh, Dark Horse books, The Massive Number One came out. Now, I read through this five seconds before we started, Did, didn't we, you and me? We read it, and uh, Dummy, you, you loved it because you love, like, really dense sci-fi, and I wasn't really sure because it's a little, it's very dense. There's a lot that happens in the first issue. They kind of go back and forth between present day and uh, the past. The gist is, the world has ended, and there's this one ship of environmentalists and some various sundry others who are trying to decide whether or not it's still worthwhile to try and save the Earth when there's not really a lot left to save. There's a sister ship, the massive that they're looking for, and there's a lot of pirates on the open seas. So there's some fun action, um, and again, a lot of very dense sci-fi. So if that is something that you like, which this dummy does, um, then you will like this. If you like a little more lighthearted fare, you might, uh, you might take a pass. Uh, and moving on from that, we're going to do uh, two Marvel books real quick. This is the exact opposite. Now, the dummy hated this because he only likes really complicated drama. This is Avengers versus X-Men versus number three of six. And I read half of this. And the reason that I only read half is because while I'm, sh I'm sure that a lot of people are really into the Thing versus Colossus, they've done a lot of Thing fights before, and I wanted to see Magic versus Black Widow. And, uh, you know, I wanted to like this. And maybe I'm a little judgmental, but the thing is, they do all these fun facts like you wouldn't know, but why would you read Avengers vs. X-Men verse unless you were really, really into Avengers and X-Men? But there's a great line in here, they do a fun fact for Magic, they're like, fun fact, demons are real! It's an actual line, and I will actually never sleep again. Thank you, Marvel. Moving on from that, we have Spider-Man. This is a great book. Uh, I had seen some early reviews of people who felt that it wasn't moving fast enough, but what I have always liked about Bendis as a writer is that he doesn't rush. And he doesn't rush with this one, and it's mostly Peter Parker, and it's fun, and it's lighthearted, but you can see where it's going to go to someplace really exciting. It's Peter Parker going to the Ultimate Universe, to that universe where that Peter Parker is dead. And really the only flaw of this book is that at one point it was said, 
that the instant that they crossed the regular universe over with the ultimate universe was the moment that they had run out of ideas. And I don't know why you would ever say that, because it was inevitable that this was going to happen. And it has happened now, and both the dummy and I agree, don't we, that this was really good. Whether you like deep, complex drama or just lighthearted fun, this is a solid read. So I would highly recommend this. This is a good one. I actually liked it. And then we're going to move on to DC. Oh, oh bless. There's all these things that came out from, uh, from DC this week, but we're not going to cover all the, the number 10s. What we're going to talk about is uh, the next part of Before Watchmen, which is Silk Spectre. And if you had heard, this was uh, plotted uh, by Darwin Cook and then uh, also written and then drawn by Amanda Connor. And gosh, it's really great. My only criticism, of course, is that once again the skin of Watchmen is over it, and they should have just done an original book. But if you don't mind that, you're going to love this. It's just... The, it's got great female characters. It's written in a really smart, dramatic way. It's a great character piece. Uh, Amanda's, Amanda Connor's art is fantastic. Uh, I love that she's got a little bit of a cheesecake quality to her art, but it's always done in a very intelligent, mature way, where it doesn't feel like it's cheap. And speaking of that, uh, cheesecake art and sometimes being a little cheap, uh, have you heard about uh, the DC number zero titles that are coming out? I'd be curious to see what you think about it. Um, me, I'm gung-ho, but the dummy, um, he saw the, the cover to Catwoman number zero, and he thought that uh, it was terrible, and that it looked like her spine was broken in 20 places, and that it was basically just a horrible TNA shot that... Uh, satisfies only the most base of audiences, only the most disgusting of needs. Uh, and while I myself am not that harsh, he was really, really livid. Uh, and uh, Kate Beaton and a number of other webcomic artists, uh, also print artists, uh, all, were not really that thrilled either. And uh, as we cycle through, take, take a look at some of these. It's actually very fun. It's always nice to see some of the, uh, the responses done in an actual comic style instead of a long diatribe, which is what the dummy would have given you, just a big, long essay of, about Feminism 101, but you don't need that. Kate Beaton, she's got it covered. But that doesn't mean that DC's got it all wrong. Uh, if you take a look real quick, this is the, um, the Batwoman, number zero, and J.H. Williams, he's always getting it done. Uh, and whether you like his particular run of the New 52 on that, he knows how to draw a woman in a cover that isn't horrifyingly disrespectful, and that's great. So... I would say read that book, and then, you know, maybe uh, maybe make your own statement. Do you like the, the idea of a number zero? Um, the dummy and I, the jury's out. Uh, but I'd be curious to see what you think, because that's going to be happening real soon. So that's it. That's everything that came out uh, that I had read this week. But remember, you can pick up everything uh, that came out and see all that stuff on fpmyc.com. Uh, and I thank you for watching, and keep reading. Right, dummy? The dummy says bye. Bye, dummy. Take care.